So last week, we left off talking about your experiences in Mexico City. Can you tell me a little bit about where you were located and how it was similar and different to living in Reading? Yes, I can. Hotel Hanover was on the outskirts of Mexico City, near the beautiful Chapultepec Park. A few blocks from the hotel was the home of the American ambassador. We often walked past his coin or are coming from one of the restaurants. About five, six blocks from the hotel was a big, wide, three-mile boulevard. It started at Chapultepec Park and went all the way downtown through the center of Mexico City. Once we got out of the boulevard, we could grab a cab for one peso or about eight cents. The cabs ran up and down the length of the boulevard, and all we had to do was hold up a finger, and he would, if he had room, the driver would stop, even though there were, might be other passengers in the car. We paid him one peso, and when you got near where you were going, he would stop and let you out. The other travel options was the trolley car. Although it was cheaper, it was usually jam-packed. Sometimes passengers had to be hanging on the outside, and the trolley car never fully stopped. It only slowed down, and passengers had to hop on or off. That's a little bit different than what you were used to in Reading, isn't it? I think sometimes they were even up on the roof. Wow! <laughs> yeah, that was a big difference. My goodness, what else can you tell me about Mexico City? Mexico City is about 7,400 feet above sea level, and I struggled with the altitude change for a week or two. I found myself getting extra tired, especially when I did some heavy lifting. Wow. So, That's all because of that high altitude. Yeah, and it didn't make you sick or anything. It just made you tired. Yeah. So what can you tell me about your work life in Mexico? How was that different than working in Reading or in North Carolina? Well, one thing, their restroom, the employee restroom in the plant was dirty and didn't have regular toilet paper. Oh it's, boy, what did they use instead? <laughs> <laughs> Instead, they used pieces of newspaper that they just threw in the corner because it was too heavy to flush down the toilet. They shoveled it out about once a week, and that got to smell a little bit, to say the least. Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Did you keep using it? Uh, it didn't take long for us to discover there was a private toilet for the owners and the office personnel. We got permission to use it, but we couldn't get the key until the office started at 8 a.m. So if you had to go before that, you had a problem. Oh, wow. So, um, <laughs> so what else can you tell me about the working life? I know you have an interesting story when you outsmarted um, some of your helpers. Yeah, I worked with some fine young fellows, but they had the bad habit of bumming cigarettes all the time. You smoked? Yes, I smoked cigarettes regularly. And American cigarettes cost 50 cents a pack. Mexican cigarettes were only 5 cents a pack, but tasted horrible. Wow, that's a big difference in price. Yeah, I couldn't afford to pay for... Seven of us smoking American cigarettes. One evening I decided to buy a pack of Mexican cigarettes. And uh, one morning I put the American cigarettes in my pocket and the Mexican cigarettes on top of my toolbox. When they came to ask me for a cigarette, I pointed towards my toolbox and said, Help yourself. That was the end of their bumming cigarettes. <laughs> That's pretty smart of you. <laughs> Setting up a decoy that nobody would want. Brilliant. 
<laughs> I need to take a cue from that. <laughs> So it sounds like there's a couple things different from your usual usual working life. I know you have a another interesting story about uh, an incident with one of your helpers. You asked them to do your laundry for you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the hotel laundry service was efficient and very reasonable. My laundry bill usually amounted to a dollar forty in American currency. That wasn't bad for a week's laundry. That included everything but my work dungarees. They got so dirty that I didn't even bring them back to the hotel. Instead, I gave them to one of my helpers, and he took them home for his mother to wash for three pesos, or 24 cents, in our money. The laundry at the hotel was done up nicely. However, you might get a laugh out of this so when I sent my pants home with my helper. It was usually a week before he returned them, and even then they were still damp. One day I questioned him about it. He told me that when he took them home, his mother washed them, and then his brother Wore them all week. What? She then washed them again, and he brought them back to work. Ah! <laughs> what? What could I say for three pesos? And you <laughs> did you keep sending your laundry with them? I think I did. <laughs> yeah, he he might have not done that again after you called him out on it. <laughs> wow! So it sounds like you were really getting a. Getting the hang of being in Mexico City. How was that for your family, though? How was how was keeping in touch with Betty? Did you talk on the phone? What did that cost? Yeah, I talked to her almost every day, and the phone was a dollar a minute. Woo! And we tried to talk no more than about eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, or else it wouldn't even be worth it to be at, down there. <laughs> Eating into your pay. Uh, I was beginning to think I might soon own the phone company. <laughs> <laughs> so how were things at home with Betty? She was running the household? It had been pretty hard on Betty since I left for Mexico. She had to take care of all the things that I always took care of, or s such as paying the bills. Still, she was pretty good with it, with it through that, and... I had no problem setting up a budget and sticking with it. The biggest challenge was running the house and looking after Mary Beth while being pregnant. I am sure there were many times when she didn't feel that great and would just as soon rest and not do much or anything. However, she had peppy little four-year-old to take care of, so that didn't happen very often. But even in the midst of all the, this, she managed to write me just about every day and kept me up to date about Mary Beth and all what's going on at home. Her letters really kept me my spirits up. I know it was time-consuming before because... Sometimes her letters were six or eight pages long. Wow, she really, she really kept you informed. On top of all of this, Betty taught mother's class Sunday school. That couldn't be too easy either. Speaking of Sunday school, she mentioned in one of the letters that she hadn't driven the car much since I left for Mexico. However, one Sunday she decided to take the car to church. She said it felt sort of strange that when she turned on the key, pulled out the hand throttle and the choke and tread on the gas, nothing happened. She tried it again. Still nothing happened. Then Mary Beth said, push the button. You didn't push the button. And sure enough, 
Betty had forgotten to push the starter button for you young people. Back in the old days, cars had hand throttles, chokes, starter buttons, and a lot of other weird things. <clears throat> Betty said that it felt strange to be behind the wheel again, but after that she didn't have any trouble. So it sounds like Betty was pretty busy at home and kind of managing to keep everything copacetic. But what were you up to in Mexico? What was your day-to-day -day like when you had free time? Well, some evenings we sat in the hotel lobby after dinner and had the chance to meet some interesting people. One time I talked to the gentleman next to me and it turned out to be Earl Stanley Gardner. He was a writer of murder mysteries and was a very interesting fellow. Wow, that's really fascinating. You should have gotten his autograph. But the Laps also invited you out to do a lot of outings with them. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Around the evening, the Laps invited me to go with them to visit a couple they knew from Reading. They had two children and he was a fixer, the mechanic that works on the knitting machines in the hosiery mill. He worked in one of the mills in Mexico City. His name was Jerry Yaus, and his wife was raised in the 700 block of Gordon Street in Reading. Oh wow, what a small world. That was about a block away from where I was born. She knew a lot of people I knew. They seemed like very nice people, and I enjoyed talking about home with her. They lived in a beautiful house with two maids, and even had a television. That gave me the chance to experience Mexican TV with their three channels. The picture wasn't very clear, and even though the Mr. District Attorney show was in Spanish, I enjoyed it anyway. I also got to watch Laurel and Hardy in English. So you ended up hanging out with the Lapps another time because Mrs. Lapp was involved in Eastern Star and there was a Mardi Gras party. Can you tell us what that banquet was like? The Lapps had two married children as well as two grandchildren and the daughter was expecting in April. Mrs. Lapp belonged to the Eastern Star, and when the shrine had a Mardi Gras, they invited me to go along to see it with them. It was more like a banquet, but the meal wasn't that much to speak of. I guess they cut down on the meal so as to make more money. They had seven girls at the party who were princess princesses from different colleges in Mexico and the United States. Each one drew a ball, one on of a basket, and the one who drew the gold ball became queen of the Mardi Gras. They also had a grab bag <laughs> where we bought a ticket to win a prize. I want a jar of Heinz onions and a jar of some kind of seasoning. I couldn't use them so I gave them to Mrs. Yaus. And then she gave me something that she won that I could take home for Betty. It was a basket that was hung on the wall and held flowers on vines in it. I don't know what it was called, but it was sort of cute. <laughs> well, that sounds nice that you had quite a few people to go out with. Yeah, I, I was meeting people all the, all the time. Yes, yeah, speaking of meeting people, you also um, had another couple interesting encounters with some famous individuals. What happened outside of the embassy one day? I think I mentioned before that the American embassy was just around the corner from my hotel. Well, it also turned out to be the home of the American ambassador to Mexico. 
on February 9th, Vice President Nixon came to visit the ambassador, and the neighborhood was crawling with police. The next evening, we ate at a restaurant near the hotel, just across the street from the American ambassador's home. Just as we came out of the restaurant, 10 motorcycle police started up the motors. They closed off the block to the traffic, and someone said the Vice President Nixon was getting ready to leave. As we stood there, sure enough, Mr. Nixon and his wife came out and got in the big black car with a procession of cars and motorcycle police. We stood right across from the driveway as this car pulled out and Mr. Nixon and his wife actually waved at us. So we waved back. Wow, and at that point he wasn't a crook. <laughs> Well, that's pretty cool. You know, in your lifetime, you've had the opportunity to <laughs> run into some pretty interesting people. Especially the vice president. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what about the coincidence with the room you were staying in at the hotel? Dr. Streeter was a very interesting man who the Laps had known <clears throat> for 14 years. He used to own a hospital in Chicago. And one day he decided to retire and gave the hospital to his employees. And he traveled ever since. He was quite knowledgeable, and Roy and I learned more from him about Mexico than I had the last five weeks living there. At the end of the day, he walked me to my hotel room, and he was surprised to discover that I was in room number 251. Ironically, he said that when he first met, I reminded him of a young fellow who was the son of a close friend of his, a Dr. Marker. It so happened that Dr. Marker had room 251 for about 10 years. During that time, he developed the medicine Cortisone. That's pretty amazing. What are the odds? Yeah. And the fact that you reminded of him of his son is pretty bizarre as well. Yeah. But thank God he spent those 10 years developing that cortisone because I use it every time I get a mosquito bite. Oh, boy. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Marker. <laughs> well, it sounds like you were really adjusting to the life in Mexico and next week, we're going to wrap up our time in Mexico and this three-part episode with all the different sightseeing you did, because that's really something special to hear. So this is our 21st episode of the Ping Jockey Podcast. I'm Marley, the co-host, sitting here with the Ping Jockey himself. Bye-bye.